Welcome to When Spreadsheets Hit the Fan, a Birdview podcast. This is a show for leaders in fast growing professional service organizations looking for the latest conversations around service delivery best practices. Let's get into the show. Hello, and welcome to When Spreadsheets Hit the Fan. I'm your host, John Litterick. In today's episode, I talk to Stephanie Curtis. Stephanie wears two work hats. First, she is the CEO of the award winning Pace Creative Marketing Agency which is a woman-led agency that builds marketing growth strategies based on data and research for predictable growth for major global companies. And in her second hat, Stephanie Curtis is also a fractional chief marketing officer herself. Stephanie has been working in a marketing communications agency capacity since 2006. Today, Stephanie is hired by venture capitalists and CEOs to lead their marketing teams to grow revenues and brand recognition through content marketing and sales. Stephanie has a passion for empowering young women to become thought leaders themselves. In today's episode, we discuss the dangers of always trying to do everything in-house without the use of a qualified expert to guide you. Stephanie will share some of her observations on this subject. And of course, at the end, Stephanie will share her spreadsheet story. If you like what you hear in today's episode, please follow the show and leave a rating wherever you're listening. Let's jump right into it. Well, Stephanie, we say this on every show, a guest with a lot of experience. You've been around the proverbial block hundreds of times. So let's get right into it. What is the biggest mistake you see organizations making and what should they stop doing right away? The biggest mistake I see executives doing again and again is doing it all themselves and not delegating parts of their business to people who may be more experienced than themselves. So I feel like leaders focus on costs instead of value. One good example is leaders of small to medium-sized companies wanting to build an in-house team, hiring employees instead of delegating strategic work to experts. I meet with leaders all the time that are reluctant to delegate and believe that they can do it all themselves. I don't want to put everybody in the same basket. So based on my experience, there's three types of executives I meet. The first ones are leaders who have created their own business from scratch and see delegating as costly. These leaders are typically superstars. They know their craft very well. They are perfectionists. They believe they have the skill set to take on many hats, if not all of the hats. They feel their work is better than any others. They are very smart that they can figure it all out because they are very smart. But understanding why these leaders are not delegating is crucial. And delegating to people who have more experience or expertise is typically difficult for these types of leaders. Yeah, well said. That's a a good profile of the first type that you mentioned. So what are the other two types that you've seen? The other two are pretty straightforward. The second one is the leader who thinks it's okay to get things done quick and cheap. They hire juniors or freelancers. They get what they pay for in terms of output, and they're okay with getting the work redone. The only common mistake that I see with these leaders is that they don't take into consideration the cost of their time to oversee, manage, lead, and coordinate teams. So instead of working on the business, these leaders working in the business. Otherwise, (laughs) it would be obvious there's no savings. It's a costly expense with no investment. And the last one is my favorite. They are leaders who have been around the block a few times, a bit like me. Uh, And and I've failed at least once. They've had a chance to reflect and learn from their failures, and they are ready to do things differently. So these guys, these leaders will choose to hire experts and delegate marketing, administration, operations, and fulfillment. Okay, thank you for kind of, I think you did a good job outlining the three types that you've seen. So let's give, can you give us an example where you've seen this mistake and can you quantify it in tangible, intangible ways? We always ask our guests to do that. So this, this is a mistake that you see often. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. I'll give you a recent real example that I, I came across. A few weeks ago, I was introduced to an owner of a technical and niche engineering firm for the clean energy industry. The business is striving right now mainly based on word of mouth, which we all know word of mouth is not a strategy. (laughs) No, it's not. And if you ever find yourself on their website, uh, there's no way you can figure out what they do and what service they provide. 
So even though this is team of engineers is the best in the industry, they are losing market share to other engineering firms that have invested in their brand messaging and marketing, yet they don't have one-tenth of their expertise. And this is something I see a lot. So after multiple conversations, the CEO made a decision to delegate the marketing communication of his engineering firm to an advertising agency. So it's great that the executive team has decided to delegate and hire experts. Uh, but the real question is, is an advertising agency the right expert to solve his business problem? Uh, I like this. Yeah, it, he's, the willingness is there to find a solution, but has they got the right the right person? Is it the right? Yeah, okay, this is a good story. I think our, a lot of our listeners will resonate with this. So the problem is not the brand and the perception of the engineering firm in the market. The problem is that no one understands the services the engineering firm offers or the business problem they solve. So this is where I feel the CEO should have delegated the decision of researching and hiring the right expert to meet their business needs to maybe an advisor or a consultant. But because he did not, I think his decision is going to be expensive. The budget for this was over $55,000. So it's an expensive mistake. Yep, I've seen this a lot. So I was talking to an EOS expert over the weekend, and one way to go around it is uh, to ask yourself, as the CEO of a company, with your skill set, would you hire yourself to do the job as an expert? Oh, okay, I like that, yeah. I know <laughs> I wouldn't hire myself, I'd fire me right away. Yeah, no, that's good, I like that. <laughs> So based on the answer you get, this will tell you if you should or should not delegate to an expert in the field. Yeah, that's it's so simple. And it's and all it takes is honesty, just self-awareness and honesty. And you can you could really see that. And that's you know, all. taking a step further, is my idea on how to solve it? Am I really qualified to even know what my problem really is? So this is good. I like that. I think that's a simple thing that people could that gut check that people could go away with. So if people should stop trying to do it all in-house and they should stop start trying to hire experts, how would you suggest they go about that? Well, I believe delegate it the right way the first time around. That would be the best answer. But for some companies, it's not possible. Basically, what I would do is do an audit of the skills and the expertise within the company and ask yourself, is your operations department based on decisions of the CEO or experts in, in the field? And once you figure this one out, then you can identify what needs to be sourced out or when you need to hire experts and for what exactly. Yeah, so definitely have an audit of yourself, that gut, that you know self-awareness gut check that you talked about earlier, and then audit all of the different roles. Are they very qualified? We here in our organization, we see that too. A company will grow and somebody in operations will need to manage the growth. And so that necessitates moving towards a bit more rigor around how they manage tasks. And then once they, they outgrow that, some rigor around how they manage projects. And then they get into multiple projects and scheduling. And pretty soon that person who just took on managing those tasks is out of their depth. They don't know how to do project management. And so knowing is the person you said in-house the right person, or do you need to actually hire someone who's classically trained, certified in the discipline? And I think the only way to kind of do that is to have an audit where people can look at your maturity level and say, okay, this is your maturity level in this function. What should your target maturity be given your growth patterns? And what's the roadmap to get there? And if the person in-house can be trained up to it, great. But if not, it's not helping them to be put in a situation of failure when you can go out and hire an expert and they can learn from that expert. So I, uh, I really agree that the audit is the first step. That's what I've seen in my experience as well. All right, well, I think you've already done it, but we like to be consistent here in the program. So this is where I ask you in one sentence just to say what you would stop doing and start doing. So are you up for the challenge? Yeah, so I would say stop trying to do everything yourself and start hiring experts to delegate specific areas of your business to get it right the first time around. Yeah, getting it right the first time around is how you avoid the costs. Yeah, that's in the perfect world, of course. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk about some theory. Uh, obviously, this is not a profound idea. This is one that everyone knows they should be doing. 
but we see it happen all the time that people don't do it, which is why you, you, both of us have seen this mistake a lot. I, I've certainly seen it a lot. So in your, your opinion, why are so many leaders making this mistake? What, what do you think is driving that behavior? It's an interesting question. I've been thinking a lot about this and I feel it's how you look at the math. Okay. And the spreadsheet can be very useful for that. Yeah, <laughs> they can. They can be dangerous too. That's why we call it when spreadsheets hit the fan. But yes, spreadsheets, they do serve a very, very useful function. So decision makers typically look at the cost itself. They tend to not look at the value, the time, or the opportunity cost. So they look at delegating a, a task to an expert from an expense standpoint, instead of looking at it as an investment. And to me, an expense is a, is a waste. And I hope you enjoy your experience type of thing. Whereas an investment is when a project is completed, you start seeing results and returns, which gets compounded over time. And so when hiring experts and you're looking at the math, it does make a difference. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree with you more, especially opportunity cost. There's a lot of times people miss what the actual opportunity was to get something done faster and of a higher quality than to get it done what they call a minimal viable product. I think minimal viable products have their place and I think agility is very important, but if the minimal viable product is actually causing you to miss out on a lot of really easy, low hanging fruit opportunities, then you've done yourself a disservice by not getting that expert that could have got you where you needed to be. So I think this is the struggle that we're facing all in this world, the speed to delivery, trying to keep it very inexpensive, trying to innovate cheaply. There's a reason why we have experts. It's thousands of years of proven out of human history that there's a reason for experts. There's a reason that we've invented higher education and PhD programs and specializations, right? Because expertise does matter. I've seen it in lots of different disciplines. I've seen one doctor give me an opinion and another doctor give me a different opinion. And the, the other doctor just has more experience in the area. And the other doctor, you know, solves the problem. Whereas one said it wasn't a solvable problem. This is a case, case of experience and knowledge, right? Expertise isn't just also your pedigree or, or your credentials. It's also your, your experience. I was talking to one nurse in an emergency room who's been doing it for 30 years and has administrated over 10,000 needle injections. And to the point now where every doctor in the hospital consults her on the best way to give a needle injection because of that experience. But she was saying that constantly first year nurses out of school who've been trained in their university program, they will tell her that she's doing it wrong. So it's not just the, the, the skill and the training. It's also the experience of knowing how something works practically. So I agree with you. And I think I'm being a little passionate about this because obviously I've seen this error a lot. It's where it's missed is the opportunity cost. I don't know if you agree with me. It's only too many CEOs miss it when, when there's a tangible benefit that they can quantify. I don't think they miss it too much. I think it's they miss it in the, op not really thinking through the opportunity cost. At least that's my opinion. I totally agree. And I, I see some of the leaders I love to work with typically have a consulting background and they don't miss that aspect. Yeah. They don't miss the opportunity, the opportunity cost. They understand the value of time and they also understand the opportunities that can be missed and the market share they can miss if it's not done correctly or the first time around. Very good. Okay. Well, we both, more so me, I'll, I'll admit that we've both been a little bit of a rant there. So we should probably provide some empirical evidence to support the theory. Do you have any? I do have some. So from what I've seen is that leaders tend to hire a full suite of executives to delegate, to build the strategic building blocks of a business. However, what we've seen is that leaders tend to not trust the team to succeed. And so, okay. for example, CMOs on average has a tenure of less than 40 months. That tells really? you, okay. yeah, it's really low if you think about it. And the, the turnaround, the turnover is really high. And so it shows it's a mistrust between CEOs and CMOs. And so that came from a research from Spencer and Stewart. And if you know, want to know more about the study, feel free to get in touch. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. So it seems like CMOs are not meeting the CEO's expectations. And so there is a disconnect between what the CEO is looking for, the expectations, the metrics, 
and who the performance and, and the performance of the person they hired. Yeah, and it's also true. I read a similar study from Infotech Research Group that uh, chief information officers, not just CMOs, chief information officers, it's about the same time frame. It's I think fifty months, four and a half years, roughly. So you make a good point. This is this is one of the the reasons. Yeah. Any other studies that you can cite for our audience? Another one will be around the delegation and how, it, well, there's two things. There's the, <laughs> the the expectations of a CEO not being met when hiring an executive and also how the executive is actually spending their time. So if I'm speaking to leaders in general, I'm always surprised by the time they spend on repetitive tasks, such as attending meetings, communicating project priorities, updating spreadsheets, managing their email inboxes, attending events, virtual events, like it's craziness. Why would a CEO or a CMO will go to an event and do a lot of admin work? And in fact, a survey from McKinsey found that nearly 60% of the marketer's time in the office goes to admin tasks. And wow. think, yeah, that's crazy, right? That's crazy. Like, I think you should be top and 7% of your day on admin tasks. <laughs> so, but it's true, right? They, a lot of the busy executives end up having to roll up their sleeves and do not even, it's not even tactical they're doing. They're doing pushing numbers on a spreadsheet that could be cut and paste functions that could be someone else could do that for them. So I agree with you. It's definitely problematic that even if you hire the right expert, you may not give them what they need to really that show their expertise, right? Because they're, they're, they're so bogged down in, in the weeds of details of admin and tactical. They can't, they can't do the strategic things that you need them to do. So. Yeah, I mean, a good example as well. I mean, yeah, so basically they hand, they're spending their time with doing day-to-day tasks like admin work instead of, of focusing on coaching, leading, or strategic projects and, and really making a bottom on, an impact on the bottom line. So they're not using their expertise within the business. They're using their project management skill within the business 60% of the time. Yeah, that's, yeah, true. That's very true. Interesting. I'd love to drill down more in the theory, and I know you have more to share, but I think just because for sake of time, we never want to not get to the how. So I think I'm going to skip a few things here that we would normally ask Stephanie, and we're going to go right to the how. So my first question on the how would be, so how does someone hearing this podcast get started? You've mentioned about the audit, but what would be the very first step to instilling in their in themselves as the leader and in the organization a new cultural mindset of looking for expertise. What would be in your your advice, the first step? It is really the audit. My first step is really reflecting. Reflecting, and that's what I call an audit. It's really reflecting okay. where you are at, what's your vision, where you want to be, and try to plan out what is it that you need to get there. And then based on that, based on the list of expertise you need, start to delegate. Very good. One thing that I've also, I don't remember who said this, but someone who said a very good leader is someone that asks and receives support organically. And I believe in this. And so I feel when you do an audit, it helps you identify where you need support, where you can help, truly help, truly make a difference in your business based on your skill set, and then take action. Yeah, it, it's huge. Where I used to work, we used to audit. IT leaders on how effective their IT strategy was. And it was it was incredible to see from the time frame of three years after the audit how much had transformed in their their business, right? Because they knew their gaps to fix, they knew their strengths, they knew their weaknesses. But uh, one one thing on I would like to get your take on it that I, I found is sometimes the word audit has a negative connotation and that scares people off. So I tend to prefer the idea of like calling it a diagnostic and, and you know, taking it where it's collaborative and inclusive with everyone. Everyone feels like they want to participate to get better. And one thing that I found could be really useful is after the diagnostic is done to, to share the results with everyone and do what's called a stop, start, continue exercise, right? This is what we all agree we should stop doing based on the audit. This is what we want to start doing. And so that might be where we need the expertise. And here's what we should continue because we feel like we got it right based on the audit. So here's what we're stopping. Here's what we're starting and we need the expertise on and here's uh, you know what we want to continue. So so again, I'm being a little bit 
preachy here because on a soapbox because I really have seen what you're talking about to be so successful. I agree. I mean, diagnostics works for me. In other words, some people like to use this needs analysis. To me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I like to define the words I'm using because we all have... <laughs> Uh, biases, yeah, right? you write different. Well, it means the same thing, but we're using a different word for it. So making sure we align our language is very important. And so it's like, I think that's what exactly what we did. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny that you say this. You see, I never see an audit as a, as a negative connotation. I really see it as a positive. I see it as, a, as an opportunity to reflect. That's what I see it as. Absolutely. It's, yeah. Very good. Well, we are both on the same page around its value for sure. Okay, so uh, what other steps do you think might work? After the, the, the diagnostics is completed, really coming down to the gaps, right? Identifying the gaps and opportunities within the companies. And this is where the mindset will need to start shifting. And sometimes you have post-its and sometimes, so for instance, a good example is stop doing it all yourself. What are you really good at? And start delegating the rest. Another one is thinking about value versus costs, right? Looking at the expertise as an investment instead of an expense. And really looking at how you can meet your gaps as soon as possible versus trying to do it all yourself. Yeah. That would be, yeah. And that having that down, identifying the gaps allows to put a bit of a plan together on priorities. What's really the biggest challenge to solve straight away? What is the second one? What's the third one? And really put a plan that way. That allows, the plan allows to uh, for leaders to stay focused. And I think that's really, really important because we tend to, as leaders, including myself, leaders and executives, we have a lot of, of demands and we do get distracted. And so having a plan really helps us stay on track and focused. Very good. Yeah, it's always amazing how it, uh, it always comes down to that planning. Well, I love how you have taken this concept uh, that we all know we should be doing and you've given some really great context for it you've given a really practical set of steps for me the audit diagnostic whatever you want to call it, is just so important i'm glad that you agree with me on the stop start continue exercise but what it, where have you seen it when someone's actually tried to do this and it backfired have you ever seen it backfire have you ever seen it where they actually regretted getting the experts and they wish they'd done it in-house oh i have not seen that okay yet Okay. I have not seen it. The only thing I can see when it's backfire is the example I've given you where you actually, as a leader, you don't really need, you don't really understand the need and you're hiring the wrong expert. And I've seen that a lot. And that's what I would call the backfiring. You hire Deloitte instead of hiring maybe someone who understands, <laughs> maybe you don't need a Deloitte to do a market fit, but you you need a mark, some type of another maybe type of an expert that will charge you less and you'll get much more value out of the experience and the strategy and the research. I've seen that, but I haven't seen, no, I haven't seen, that's the only reason I can think of, the only example that I, that I can think of. What about you? Do you have been in a situation where... I'll say it like this. Yeah. If it's a true expert, yeah. what I've seen in my 25-year career is massive acceleration. They push the, the envelope incredibly. So for instance, 25 years ago, I didn't know very much about sales. I had to go through sales training courses. And I would go on one course with an alleged expert and I would, as would my colleagues, and we'd come away going more than that, that alleged expert that we didn't get any value out of that. Right. That didn't move the company forward and it was an expense. And then there was other ones where half an hour into the, the training, you realized if I just do that one thing, I'm going to double my sales. Right. And of course, across 50 salespeople, that's it's like an incredible amount of like change. So I've seen it mostly in my life in terms of sales training, someone that really knows this, how to do complex sales and can train you and give you insights on how to do it. Like I've seen how much it can improve the game. And if you know you multiply that out by 50, 60, 70 sales reps, it's staggering, right? If every sales rep improves even just 10%, that's, ten, that's like increasing the bottom line 10% of the organization. So giving a long answer. So I've never seen it backfire when it's a true expert. I've only seen them just really exploit that opportunity cost for the benefit of everyone in the company. I have seen it backfire when it's not an expert, when it's a pretend expert. Exactly. And there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> so yeah, there it, 
As you were speaking, something resonated with me a lot. So I, you know, would call someone who comes in and trains, let's say, a team on sales, in your example. I would call them more advisors because they come in, they're unbiased, there's no politics at all, and they're really here to make a difference for the company and for your team. They, they really have your best interest in mind. And I agree with you. I was talking to an, an EOS, again, a specialist over the weekend, and you were saying... He became a specialist because he sold his company implementing EOS himself. <laughs> and, and his competitor actually had an EOS implemented that he hired and he paid for and he invested in. And their company actually gained two, two years basically in, in getting into market. So they got into market faster. They got done things better in terms of operations, even in marketing, in fulfillment. <laughs> in all areas of the business and they, the competitors sold their business for a lot more money than he did as a self EOS implementer. And I felt that shows you can try to do everything yourself and you might do a good job, but you're probably better off getting an ex expert on board or an advisor to be unbiased, to really give you the feedback you're looking for and the direction and leadership to get to there faster and do it better. You'll win at the end. I believe as a leader, you you can only win. Yes. <laughs> this... uh, absolutely. Well, this has been a great a great conversation. I believe anyone that's listening to this, if they're a business leader, they're they're doing what we always want. They're doing a bit of a gut check, and they're thinking to themselves, you know, how much have I instilled this kind of culture? And they're thinking about this. Do I really give my team and my company a chance to audit themselves regularly to figure out what what we're stopping and we don't need to continue what we're doing well and we can continue and what we need to start doing because there's opportunity costs that are being missed but we just if we try to get there through bootstrapping and trial and error in the long run we're going to lose because of the opportunity cost so let's start let's get an expert in can, can get us working there faster so i think leaders will appreciate that but i also think anybody that's a project manager or an operational person is not a leader is doing like a tactical function We'll, we'll think about it and, and, you know, ask yourself, can you be trained up to where you need to go? Or really, do you need to really make a case for expertise, right? Because in the end, you know, you're not helping yourself if, if you're going to cause a, a failure because you're out of, out of your depth. So I think it's also good for tactical people listening to this, you know, to recognize it. I'm going away thinking about myself. What areas do I need to think about where I could ask for more help and more expertise? So I think it's on a personal level, it's been really, really good. So I really enjoyed the conversation. Love to have you back in the in the future, and thank you for being on one spreadsheet at the fan. But uh, we always end the program. What's your your Excel spreadsheet story, good or bad? So I have lots of examples of situations where there's no spreadsheet, and the business hits the fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. That's a good twist on it. I like that. Yeah. But in my, in my case, I believe I initially started my business, of course, with a spreadsheet for managing projects and a spreadsheet for managing leads to reach out to. And then I quickly realized, you know, spreadsheets, we're not going to cut it. So my first, I started my own business, my first business in 2006. And soon after that, we started to, we got a project management system in place to, to manage tasks and manage projects so that there was no errors or reduced amount of errors, the deadlines were going to be met, and then the correct information is entered. So early on, I realized <laughs> spreadsheets on their own, we're not going to cut it for, for me and my mindset, especially as a, I really think about operations and delegating tasks. And so I feel like investing in, into a project management tool of some sort or, or CRM tool, depending on on the goals of, of the spreadsheet is is the way the way to go actually good yeah well based on where i work i would agree with you wholeheartedly so <laughs> yeah it's true well, it's funny it's it's in-house expertise versus true expertise the same thing with spreadsheets right there's a point yeah. where spreadsheets make sense and then there's a point where you outgrow, outgrow them it's the same concept right so yeah good story and interesting how it's par uh, parallels to the theme of the discussion so yeah. Well, we're coming up on the holidays. So I wish you, Stephanie, a wonderful holiday and a prosperous new year. And to anyone listening to this in the month of December, the same, same as well. Wishing everyone a great end to 2022 and a prosperous 2023. Bye for now. Thank you very much. 
You've been listening to When Spreadsheets Hit the Fan, a Birdview podcast. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you like what you've heard, please rate the show. That helps us to keep delivering the latest and best practices for professional service teams. Until next time.